Welcome to Theology Unplugged Live. I'm Michael Patton, and we are going to be doing a session of Stump the Chump today. That is a session where I answer questions that people give to me, theology questions, pastoral questions, Bible questions, and the like. Or at least I attempt to answer them the best I can. So I'm going to spend about five minutes on each one of these questions, and we'll try to get through them if I uh, stick to the timer. I've got a timer right here, big timer, so that I can see it. Make sure I don't go over the five minutes. But first, remember to subscribe uh, and hit the alert button so that you know whenever we go live, whenever we post new videos. We've been posting a whole lot lately. A lot of videos from Credo Courses. Really exciting time for the Facebook of Credo House. Or excuse me, the, the YouTube of Credo House. So make sure you subscribe to it, tell your friends. And uh, let's get this thing. Let's get this thing rolling. Uh, maybe pretty soon here we'll we'll get enough uh, of you guys together, get enough uh, stuff going on to where we can start a new Credo House again. That is one of my goals: is to have the Credo House coffee shop uh, like we had it before, and uh, get that back. So let's start with the first question. Got all my questions right here, and I think I'm going to start with this one because it's very relevant. I just had to talk to my daughter about this. And this is, um, uh, how do I get rid of my paralyzing anxiety? So start. Um, <laughs> how do you get rid of your paralyzing anxiety? Well, I might throw this back at you. How do I get rid of my paralyzing anxiety? Uh, because I have it. Uh, I mean, I'm a very anxious person. I'm not as anxious as I used to be. I've had to deal with it for a long time. Those of you who have had to deal with it, we've all got methods to deal with it. Um, you know, Christ, whenever he's talking about anxiety, and I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 6, he says, I tell you, for therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? And which one of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so loved the clothes, uh, so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive today and gone tomorrow and is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But for seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, uh, because tomorrow needs to take care of itself, will take care of itself. I'm a very anxious person. Uh, I, I don't follow this well. I'm better than I used to, like I said. I do have a method. Usually it's about, I mean, obviously, anxieties uh, worry about the future, and, you know, uh, depression is uh, sadness about the past. And we, so many of us worry about the future. Uh, we worry about finances. We worry about uh, our jobs. We worry about our family. We worry about the effect of things that we have done upon people and uh, we worry about our love life we worry about so many different things my primary thing and a lot of guys primary thing is uh, worrying about how to provide and whether or not we're going to be able to provide and it can be paralyzing I mean I've, I've sat many many times in a paralyzing state where my heart is just beating so incredibly fast and I can't get up I can't move because it's so bad I'm just so scared about how am I going to pay the bills? I mean, it's just, it's built into me. It's built in, I, we're, we're, we're providers. Uh, guys are providers. And I'm not saying girls don't have the same worries, but guys have this because we, we normally are expected to take care of the family and to provide for the family. And what if we don't, we don't feel like we're doing our job or being a man. And it just scares us. It can be very, very scary. I, I do want you to know that. And I, I get very scared often. Uh, and I often think I'm not a very good provider and I can't fulfill those things and, you know, you, all the feelings of worthlessness and everything. Whenever you get into this state, it is a snowball. It can take over and it can exasperate the problem, making it worse because you can't do anything that you need to do that you're, you're worried about. Christ says, do not worry about tomorrow 
uh, for tomorrow, for today, has enough troubles, troubles of its own. And I, in this, I see that, that Christ is looking towards the future, and he's, he's saying today, here's today before you. Take action today. Let tomorrow take care of itself. And the actions that you take care of, uh, that you do today, uh, will, will feed into tomorrow. My, my, the, I have a method. Here is my method whenever I get into this. I have to have some sort of plan. Some sort of plan for today to take care of whatever problem I'm going through. Financial problem or whatever else. And I, I come up with a plan of things that I can do that are effective. Whether or not they're going to work or not doesn't matter right now. It's different steps. I kind of draw them out in my mind. Okay, if th I'm going to do this. If that doesn't work, I'm going to do this. If that doesn't work, I do this. And usually it's compounding and the, the, the ladder gets worse and worse, but it's still, I have to get to the point, okay, if all else fails, what? Uh, and then this is where I go to my second point. If all else fails, if I, if I get kicked out of my house, lose everything, can't pay bills, I'm still better off than most of the people of all of history. That is very important to remember, and that's the second part of what you should know whenever you're, you're anxious, where you're at. I'm, I know not everybody's at that place, but we all uh, can't, most of us can think that way, especially here in America. My five minutes is up on that one. We're going to go to the next one. The next question is this. Let's see here. Um, well, let's do a relevant one. Uh, which has to do with uh, Halloween. I, it doesn't necessarily have to do with Halloween. It's not should Christians celebrate Halloween, although that is a relevant one that I would like to take up sometime. But it's uh, uh, should Christians believe in ghosts? Now, I like this one a whole lot because I like the idea. I, I like shows. I like the ghost hunter shows. These things became very popular. They're very popular today. Started back in the early 2000s with ghost hunters. Now we've got I mean, dozens of them, dozens of ghost hunters, paranormal investigators is what they're called, going to people's houses, going to uh, old hospitals and stuff like that, and uh, researching. Now, traditionally, if you're a Christian, the, the best way to do this, uh, or the, the way you should think, this is should think, is that all ghost activity is brought about by demons, demons trying to mislead you. Now, this may very well be the case. I'm not saying it's not. I don't necessarily believe it. I, I mean, I could be wrong about this very easily, but I don't necessarily think it's always demons. I mean, I know that demons are around using things. Maybe they use this kind of stuff. But I, I think there are there's a possibility that there are disembodied spirits of people st still here, here on the earth. Now, hang with me. I know a lot of you guys, you're, you're you know, uh, turn, getting ready to turn me off. But listen... Um, in the Bible, you have a few instances where you do have disembodied spirits. You have the instance with the witch of Endor in Samuel, where King Saul, I forgot to start this, <laughs> we'll just say two minutes so far, uh, where King Saul goes to the witch of Endor and, the witch of, and asks the witch of Endor to bring back Samuel so that he could guide him uh, as the Philistines attack. Um and uh, he's scared, and so he wants a prophetic guidance from Samuel. So the witch of Endor does indeed bring Samuel up from the dead. Uh, whether or not it was her power or, or Samuel came up from the dead because uh, in spite of her, God uses this. But either way, it was Samuel. It says it was Samuel. He was clothed very similarly. He was still old, so it's a very interesting. He didn't have his new body, but in his spirit, they could recognize it. So there's some recognition here to his disembodied spirit where he says, why have you brought me back from the dead? There's also the time whenever Jesus is standing on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Elijah and Mo Lo Moses, Elijah and Moses come and meet him and are talking to him. Now, uh, Peter recognizes both of them. I don't think he knew the way they looked. He probably listened and heard them and uh, somehow figured out they were Moses and Elijah. But either way, there was disembodied spirits there. Christ is walking on water, and the uh, disciples scream and yell, It's a ghost! It's a ghost! Uh, and Jesus comes to him and says, Ghosts don't have flesh and blood. He didn't say ghosts don't exist. He said ghosts don't have flesh and blood. So you may be asking me, all right, Michael, if there are such a thing as ghosts, how in the world can that be? Aren't, aren't unbelievers in hell and believers in heaven with Christ? Well, I do believe believers are in heaven with Christ. 
I, I don't, I, I mean, of course, you know, like Saul or Samuel and Elijah and Elijah, maybe sometimes they, they appear down here. I don't know but if there's a mission of God or something. But um, I do not believe that hell right now is open for business. Now, again, hang with me. I do not believe hell exists right now. Uh, well, it's being prepared because the Bible says it's prepared for the uh, angels or the demons and Satan in Revelation. Uh, but I don't think it exists right now. I think only after judgment will hell exist. Now, you got to understand, God does not judge people until they're in their full bodies, until the resurrection. The judgment doesn't happen individually as people die. He judges them and then they go to hell. And I think God's justice requires that they be judged first. Um, it's kind of like maybe hell is that their, or their ghost being here on earth is that they are out on bell waiting for their arraignment, for their, for their, uh, judgment. Um, and you may say, wait a minute, Michael, do, uh, aren't people, uh, in, in the rich man and Lazarus, doesn't that show that hell exists? No, it doesn't because the rich man and Lazarus not meant to walk on all four legs and give us a timetable. I think it was a general, large understanding of what happened at the end to the rich man and to Lazarus, not necessarily what happens immediately. So I do not think hell is open for business. Maybe there are unbelievers here on earth, but whenever you're talking about children, that's where I have a problem. There's a lot of times you see these children that show up as ghosts in all these shows. And I don't, I don't think there can be children ghosts because I believe that children automatically go to heaven. Um, and I am out of time with this one, but uh, we'll leave it at that. Maybe we, we can do follow-up later on. Okay, next question. Let's see here. Should Christians watch Game of Thrones? <laughs> I hear that quite a bit too. Uh, simply because uh, you have um, uh, this is so popular today. So many people are watching. I don't know how many it is. I think it's like 20 million people were watching Game of Thrones or maybe 10 million people. Still a lot of people that are watching Game of Thrones. And you hear Christians talk about it as well. Sometimes you hear Christians condemning it. And I think it's a matter of conscience. There's nothing in the Bible that says yes or no. What I do whenever it comes to entertainment, and I have a link to this, and I also have a link to the ghost one and the uh, one of the one that ones that follow. Um, shoot, I forgot to start this again. I am too new to this, but I have some links down uh, in the in the description uh, for you that have articles that I wrote about each one of these. But I use this uh, this analogy of uh, accessibility. And whenever you're talking about movies and the Things that they show, what the things that are uh, bad in the movie, uh, they said, you watch it. Can you watch it? And I say, well, maybe. I mean, yeah, maybe you can watch things that are bad, cussing and, and uh, things that uh, maybe most people try to stay away from in R-rated movies. Uh, the Bible, if it were turned into a movie, a real movie, would be R-rated. And it describes many things that are, you know, terrible and, and sickening and... and uh, evil and embarrassing. Uh, that's one of the things I love about it so much. It doesn't hold back on uh, displaying the, the genuineness of the failures of the past and the sinfulness of people. Now, when we're watching it for entertainment, you got to understand entertainment was made by God. The entertainment is not evil. I can't. I, it drives me crazy whenever Christians believe that we're supposed to be sulking all the time. We can't laugh. We can't make jokes. We can't, we can't have fun. We can't, we can't be entertained. Um, even at church, sometimes people say church should not be about entertainment, just sh should be about learning. And I say, wait a minute, what, what's the, why can't you combine the two? I mean, isn't that very effective? Didn't God create it in such a way? Um, so I think that, uh, you got to look at it in such a way of what is the sin and how is it being promoted? Number one, you got to ask, is it accessible? Is this sin accessible? Like, for instance, whenever we're talking about, and then we're going way back in time here, but the Harry Potter series. I remember whenever that came out, and there were groups of Christians going around to churches trying to trying to get a voice, get a time at that church to be able to speak against Harry Potter. And I thought, well, that's silly. Why, why would you want to talk against some, you know, m magic movie show type series or something? They say, well, because it promotes um, witchcraft, it promotes that, and that is evil. And, you know, I look at that and I say, wait a minute. I mean, 
does it really? I mean, is it promoting witchcraft? And, uh, you know, since it came out, it's been many years, you know, a decade or so. How many people have you seen that have become warlocks and witches because of that? Does it really pre uh, present spells and such that work and that that's really tempting to follow? I just don't see that at all. I think it's kind of silly to use that as an example. Uh, another thing is, uh, does it does it celebrate it? Does it celebrate the sin? Is the sin in it shown to be something that, hey, this is something great, is something that we, we should love and, and we should strive for? Oftentimes in things, the sin is not celebrated. I love Beavis and Butthead. I may get in trouble for that, but especially they started up again in the new one. And one of the things about Beavis and Butthead is Beavis and Butthead, yeah, their their rank, their their uh, uh, you know their act out, their se sexual desire, or their they have a desire. They, basically, the entire time, all they want to do is score, quote unquote, score, and they never do. And the thing about that is, it doesn't present it in a positive sense. It doesn't present these little teenagers going around trying to be cool, trying to get drunk, trying to have sex as something cool. It presents it as something really, um, you know, the, the way our the way our youth have failed, and how stupid it is to act like this. What what losers Beavis and Butthead are, and it gets down to the deepest part of us, and we identify with it, but we also become embarrassed along with Beavis and Butthead because they're just they're just rejects. It doesn't present it as something positive. So that's the best I can do on that because Game of Thrones, you have the same type thing, and I don't really see it as something that is that is accessible in the, uh, in the sense that uh, there's anything in there that is different from what we see every day, and I don't see it as something that is necessarily celebrated either. Uh, so we'll stop there, and let's go to the next one. I'm going to hit start like I should. Uh, is suicide an unforgivable sin? This is very commonly held belief among Christians, among Protestant Christians even. As a matter of fact, I had a guy recently that was going to be part of our ministry and donate big to our ministry, and that was the question he had. And after he found out that I said no, uh, it is not an unforgivable sin. He said he does not share our views anymore, and he cannot donate to us. So I was very sad about that. I was uh, wanting to have an opportunity to talk to him about this very issue, because I think it is something that goes to the heart of the gospel, the heart of the good news, the heart of salvation. It, why would we say that suicide is an unforgivable sin? First off, ask that question. Why would we say that? Suicide is murder of our own selves. It's the killing of ourselves. And so it would be the same same thing as saying, is murder the unforgivable sin or a unforgivable sin? And of course, we would say no. I mean, look at David. He murdered many, many people uh, whenever, he, and whenever he pushed Uriah to the front lines and his whole group, his whole battalion to the front lines, and they all died, and David did that on purpose. David was a murderer. There are many people that have committed all kinds of sins, every sin in the book, but it can't, the cross is powerful enough to forgive any sin. The reason why we often think suicide is an unforgivable sin is because it is a folk theology. It is something that's been handed down so much that it's become ingrained in our brain. We were, we've heard it since we were young. We have taught it uh, without explanation, and it just becomes okay accepted. It's it's uh, blind faith that we put in that. And it comes from the Catholic Church. Uh, sorry to jump on Catholics here, but Catholics have that is a mortal sin. They have Roman Catholic Catholicism has two types of sins. They have venial sins and mortal sins. Mortal sins are the sins that you can commit that can that can divest you of, can remove the uh, graces of God, can remove your salvation from you. Then you have to go to a priest and get absolved of that sin where the priest gives you some type of penance to do and you do that penance and then you are back to being saved. Protestants, we don't believe that. We believe salvation is by faith alone. We don't believe you have to go through a mediator, a priest. We believe the only mediator to God is Jesus Christ. And so we go to Christ. And also we believe that whenever we ask Christ, whenever we place our trust in Christ, the moment we rest in him, recognizing that we are a sinner, 
uh, he, we are saved. It's not a potential thing. It's not a temporary thing. To be saved is to be saved from hell. So you can't be saved one moment and uh, uh, not saved the next. You're either saved from hell, because that's future, or you're potentially saved. We don't believe in potential salvation. We believe in actual salvation because that's what Christ says. He who believes in me will have eternal life. Uh, the person who believes in me is saved. And so that is the good news. It's a wonderful thing. I will read through the book of John, John chapter 6. You can find this very clearly. Uh, but the Roman Catholics believe in mortal sins. Mortal sins remove the graces of God. And let me give you some mortal sins. Uh, I'm, I'm giving you these, but there's no official list in the Roman Catholic Church of mortal sins. There's no uh, dogma of mortal sins, which is disturbing if you're a Catholic. It should be disturbing if you're Catholic, because you don't really know which ones are mortal sins. Venial sins are those small things, you know, a little white lie, and uh, maybe, maybe uh, uh, getting drunk, that kind of thing. But uh, mortal sins like murder, adultery, um, uh, the the uh, killing of yourself and the like. Uh, one of the things that's a mortal sin, interesting, is not going to church without a, a valid excuse. Uh, just you can pretty much add anything to it. It's a very fluid. It's a wax nose, uh, unfortunately, and uh, they believe that mortal sins remove the grace of God. We do not believe in mortal sins as Protestants. We believe that. And and then listen to this. A mortal sin, put it this way, Roman Catholics believe that suicide is an unforgivable sin. The unfor one of the, the unforgivable sins. Reason for that is because you commit murder and you die at the same time. So there's no way to ask for forgiveness to go to a priest. Uh, but they've changed some, let me be fair, they've changed some recently to where you any mortal sin has to be done with personal intent, has to be done um, in your right mind. Now, who commits suicide in their right mind? So, basically now, it's like uh, Roman Catholicism can forgive uh, suicide because nobody's in their right mind when they commit suicide. Okay, uh, that is done with this one. Let's go to the next one. Uh, do I have to go to church to be a Christian? Um, oops, let stop. Reset, go. I, I, you know, I, I always have trouble with this idea, and we talk about this. We talk about going to church. Where does it say anywhere, going to church? Where does it ever talk about going to church? We act as if church, a building, you go in there and you, you kind of check off your, your uh, Christianity for the week. And if you go to church, it's just something that... Uh, uh, you can say, uh, adds to, contributes to your salvation or the it, it evidences your salvation, going to church. I don't think church is something that you go to. I think church is something that you do. Now, of course, I believe that we that one of the ways we can do this, one of the best ways that we can do this, is gathering together with other believers at some place. It doesn't have to be a building. Uh, it can be outside. It can be at your house. It can be uh, you know small churches everywhere have this, or it can be a church or a very large, large church building. It can be online even. I think uh, that that qualifies. I do have some problems with the online thing, but that's not. That's not for today. I, I, at least it does accomplish some of what we're trying to do when we talk about church. Uh, in Hebrews, it says, do not neglect the gathering together of believers. In 1 John, it talks about uh, loving our brothers. And so there's this idea of fellowship. And uh, in Acts chapter 4, it talks about the community gathering together and doing certain things uh, preaching the gospel, evangelizing the lost, uh, having koinonia, fellowship together, breaking of bread, uh, taking of the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, and and the like. And they were doing all these things together. And so there's a community gathering. There is a, a, a church being done there. They weren't at a building when they did it. They were just doing church. So I think that we got to understand that, no, no, you don't have to go to church if you're a Christian. Uh, you need to do church if you're a Christian. You do need to find a way to fellowship with other believers. Um, and otherwise, you can't. You, there's so many things you can't do. 
I think there's like uh, two or three hundred one another passage commands in the Bible. Love one another. Uh, be be good to one another. Uh, bear with one another. If if you're not with other people, how in the world can you do church? There's a challenge that's being with other people, but there's a blessing. And you exercise your gifts with other people. You're able to edify other people. They are edi able to edify you. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's frustrating sometimes. And yes, there are problems with a lot of churches that you know, see church as something that qualifies them for heaven, that that they become somebody different whenever they walk through the doors of the church, where they put on the masks that uh, are their church masks, their Christian masks, and they're no longer who they were throughout the rest of the week. Those are unfortunate things, and the church needs to work on that quite a bit. Uh, I think it's one of the biggest problems in the church today is we don't really know how to be authentic. We don't really know how to be ourselves. And if we're not going, gathering together and being ourselves, then we're not really fulfilling the, uh, the goal of um, uh, gathering together with other believers. We're neglecting that. And so we need to do the best we can to be transparent and find ways to be real with each other, to be who we are. There's no way other people can help you or you can help somebody else if you're not real, if you're not transparent. Yes, it's embarrassing sometimes. Yes, it's hard sometimes. But let me tell you something. Every one of us have significant problems. We are broken people. The church is a hospital that we go to. And you, you don't get embarrassed at hospitals when we go in room to room and you see people in there broken. That's just the way we are. We're spiritually broken all together, and we're helping each other. You can't really go through this alone. People who get sick, have cancer, uh, have broken legs, whatever, they don't go through this alone. They have to go someplace where they get help. And you are broken. I am broken. We are in the midst of fixing each other, becoming what we need to be. But we still remain broken this entire time while we are here on the earth until we reach heaven. So, yes, you should go to church. What happens if you don't ever go to church? Are you still a Christian? I'd say, sure, you can still be a Christian, of course, because that's between you and Christ. That's the gospel. That is the forgiveness of sins. If you have eternal life, you have eternal life. It's not you have eternal life if you do all these things. But hopefully, if you're a Christian and you're following the Lord, we want to obey the Lord. And we want to, we want to um, love other people and love the brethren in the church. So, no, you... Uh, uh, don't have to go to church, but you definitely should go to church. Okay, that was Theology Unplugged Live, the Stump the Chump, Chump edition. Uh, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. This is the first one. I didn't even advertise it anywhere because uh, this is the first time I've done something like this on uh, Facebook or on uh, for Theology Unplugged. But I do thank you for coming, and remember to subscribe. Uh, we're going to keep on doing this and lots more stuff. It's really an exciting time for Credo House Ministries. And check out the links below for uh, articles that I have written on this.